I hope this audio sounds different from my previous videos because I got a microphone for Christmas. Whether I know how to use it well is another issue, but this has got to be better than me yelling into voice memos on my laptop. So let's talk about Bob Dylan. Not Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. The man, the myth, the amazing fastest violinist certified in Australia, and some may even say he's the fastest in the world. If you're anything like me, you might have heard of him after classical violinists and YouTubers Two Set Violin reviewed his very official world record attempt on Australian daytime talk show Studio 10. According to their reaction video, it seemed that even before they got to it, a good portion of the general public was already aware of how awful and insane the interview and world record attempt was, so they didn't really change anybody's minds with their video. But as usual, I like to give these seemingly unlikable people the benefit of the doubt. Because an interview could have taken place on a bad day, or shows could be scripted weirdly, yet it could unfairly end up as the sole representation of a public figure. After my last video discussing the career path of Ben Lee, the last Guinness World Record holder for the fastest violinist in the world, who's faced similar backlash to Bob Dylan due to the resurfacing of a similarly disastrous interview, tap the card up top if you haven't watched that video, I received several requests asking if I could attempt to research and possibly exonerate another speedy boy that we know and love. At first, I was worried that I wouldn't have enough material to make a video about him because he doesn't have a large social media presence, and perhaps because of that I didn't find the kind of widespread hate Ben Lee faced directed toward him. However, through my research I found that Bob's website and traditional media such as newspapers and articles had a lot of information to offer about him. So without further ado, let's see what we can find out about Mr. Vojislav Dylan Elsley. Maybe roast some of it, and most importantly, see what we can learn about him and the music industry along the way. Well, musical geniuses are born, not created, and violinist Vov Dylan is no exception. And since then, he has become the world record holder for the world's fastest violinist. Amazing! What they've done is they've put these electrodes with a chat from NASA and made the violin would settle down so it sounds a lot older than what it actually is. The actual record is 38.1 seconds, mm -hmm. which actually means you do about 22 notes per second. Yes. Let's start with talking about the main reason why some of you watching may already know who Bob Dylan is. He claims to be the world's fastest violinist after having played Rimsky-Korsakov's Flight of the Bumblebee in 38.1 seconds. Bob obviously takes great pride in his record, having dedicated an entire page on his website to chronicling the trials and tribulations of becoming the speedy superhero humanity needed. He sets the stage by describing the origin story of the fastest violinist world record, how it began as a fun joke for encore stages before the David Garrett nation attacked and made it serious, which was the bat signal for Vov to swoop in and fulfill his duty of claiming the title of fastest violinist in the world. Just listen to how Vov talks about getting the record in this radio interview. The, the game started with the, the violinist David Garrett, where he dropped it down to a minute and seven seconds. Then it went across to England, where a chap called Ben Lee dropped it down a bit. Then it went across to a girl in Indonesia. Then it went back to England again. And it kept on dropping and dropping and dropping. He talks about it like it's the World Cup, and his remarkable feat of superhuman nature put Australia on the map. Well, the record was only certified within Australia, not internationally, but I'll give it to him. A record is a record. So how did Bob come to get it? The story goes that he was playing a gig for a separate record-breaking event taking place at a mall, and he just decided off the top of his head that he was going to break a record he hadn't considered before this event. And without any practice, Vav got within seconds to Ben Lee's world record at the time that he didn't beat only because he didn't know it existed. Not mentioning how suspicious it is that official adjudicators for a country's book of records didn't bother looking up what the standing record was before Vav attempted to break it, I also think it's so nice of Vav to emphasize that he got a time of 58 seconds without any practice, just to remind us all of how awesome he is and how much better he is than the average human, because this isn't Maybelline. He was born with it. However, being supernaturally fast by pure talent alone just wasn't enough for our brave turbo-powered pioneer, so he set off to do what was formerly thought impossible, to officially break the record at the launch of his new string quintet show on Australia Day weekend and make his nation proud. He'll have us know that leading up to the event, he was hitting times of 52 seconds, easy, a piece that typically takes a minute 20 for regular good violinists. Bob could nearly half that time in his sleep. Somebody ought to stop it. 
unfortunately, less than a week before he was set to break the world record and everybody's minds in the process, somebody did try to stop our hero in his tracks. A foe has emerged by the name of Yara Bahonar of Iran, who has suddenly raised the bar to a blistering 44 seconds. How could he do such a thing right before what was supposed to be Bob's glorious marriage of sports and art, a triumph for all of Australia to witness? But just when we thought all hope was lost, our fast-fingered fiend show that he is not at all daunted by mortal obstacles, because thanks to the assistance of Caffeine, his wife, and perhaps trading his soul to the devil, the supersonic Bob Dylan showed up to Lazat's DY on January 26, 2014, a date that will live in the Hall of Fame forever, and pull off the legendary times of 39.8 seconds on his first try, and later, due to popular demand, the famed 38.1 second rendition, answering the call to defend the honor of Australia and all of music once and for all. After Vov pushed the very boundaries of human possibility, every single door opened at his request. He had a marketable hook that could get him promoted by the media, and most importantly, let him tour for years under the name the world's fastest violinist at least according to Australia. The only reason why Guinness didn't recognize it is because, and I quote, it is impossible to go faster while still maintaining musical recognizability. If I'm understanding this correctly, this sentence is implying that Bob's record was the last valid entry, the final bastion of human possibility, and that Guinness had to protect future attempters from inevitable self-destruction should they spontaneously combust from the sheer speed required to dethrone Bob's existing record, which leaves him triumphant as the fastest violinist in the world forever. He can break his record again and again in front of live audiences for years to come. Except he does have a disclaimer, which says to not expect musical brilliance from his live record breaking and instead expect a fart blowing in the wind. But I should say, if anyone goes looking for this performance online anywhere, it is there, but don't expect musicality. <laughs> if you, uh, Your I, expression I like was a bit limited. <laughs> Yes, I, I haven't got the... Ch uh, you, in that sort of time frame, you don't have moments to f do fine crafting of phrasing and dynamics. It's more like a, a fart blowing in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> I was under the impression that the validity of the record centered about maintaining musical recognizability. If Bob admits that he's not completely delusional and recognizes that he does not have this musical recognizability, what does it even mean for him to hold this record? You also may have seen that Vav has called his record breaking, especially during his shows, tongue in cheek, mere spectacles. They're not meant to be serious at all, he's just having fun. I personally also believe breaking records should be fun, it's why most people attempt world records to begin with. The next time you catch yourself or somebody else dunking on a world record for being stupid or pointless, remember that most of the time these are regular people having innocent fun. And I can confidently say that all of the fastest violinists from David Garrett to Ben Lee to Bob Dylan and everybody in between were all at least partially motivated by the record being a fun personal challenge. However, what I find especially jarring in this case is the degree to which Bob defends his supposedly not serious tongue-in-cheek party trick. Remember how he said earlier on his page and also in separate interviews that playing fast used to not be serious before David Garrett kicked off the competition that he had to avenge for his country like he's Usain Bolt at the Olympics? Bob is obviously proud of his record and wears it like a badge of honor to every interview and treats it like a VIP pass to every tour and media opportunity he gets, but the instant anybody calls the musical integrity or the validity of the record into question, he immediately backpedals and insists that it's just a prank bro, even in the comments of his YouTube videos that nobody's watching. As I proceed onto other elements of his career, I want you to hold this discrepancy in your mind of how Vov can't seem to decide whether his world record is meant to be taken seriously or not, and why that might be the case. The most reputable source for getting to know more about a public figure is their own website. And let me tell you, going through Bob Dylan's website was a trip and a half. In my last video, Ben Lee's website suffered from having too little content due to neglect. Many links were outdated, and half the pages didn't work. Bob Dylan's website has the opposite problem. There was so much stuff I had to go through. Not only were there tabs on the top and the bottom of the site, there were even tabs in tabs that were the same tabs already listed in the aforementioned locations. You already know your girl looked through every single one of those tabs and found that most of them are 
pretty useless. Not only do some of these tabs not exist, a lot of these tabs could have been hyperlinks on one page. I really don't think he needs five separate tabs advertising his services for weddings, functions, retail centers, Christmas music, and specifications for chamber music. He also has separate tabs for every single tour he's done, which were already all listed on the shows tab, even if they've been over for months. He also has three separate tabs, which I assume are automatic messages you get after you send him an email through the website, listed as links on the bottom of this page. You see, I looked through all these tabs so you wouldn't have to, and now I'll talk about the tabs that actually have interesting content. I'm on his first about page, which he has three of for some reason. The first line we see is, Bob Dylan is an Australian violinist who has many strings to his bow. He likes that metaphor so much, he used it again to promote one of his tours. That phrase made me so confused when I read it. First of all, bows don't have strings. Bows have hair. That play on strings. I was thinking that maybe he's saying he's able to play on multiple strings at once, which I think is a comparison to his many talents. But playing on multiple strings is a skill that all violinists will learn at some point, and it isn't some rocket science level maneuver that only a select few humans on Earth can pull off. The man might not be good at violin-centric metaphors, but I can rest assured that he's an amzing violinist who is able to be con multiple world tours. Okay, maybe spelling isn't among the many strings to his bow either. So what talents does he have? Other than being a renowned violinist, I found that the man can sing as well. Which I found out because of this performance he put on his videos page. I'm old fashioned. I love moonlight. I love the old fashioned things. The sound. First thing I see about this video is the abysmal like-to-dislike ratio, and I really wonder why so many people disliked the video with barely over 600 views. Unlike his infamous world record attempts, I didn't think this was a bad performance. Sure, the music might sound a little dreary and it drags a little bit, but I don't think it warrants a dislike. I then wondered if it was people going around disliking all of his performances after seeing his bad world records, but one, I think this video is pretty hard to find. Two, it wasn't even uploaded by Vov himself, so this unfortunate audience member uploading Vov's concert clips is getting all the dislikes. And three, there aren't any comments, but it could be that this guy's deleting any negative comments he gets. It might not be the case that people are hating on Vov, but it still needs to be said. If you see somebody do something stupid or sketchy and you've maybe seen somebody else roast them for it, don't use that as an excuse to go insult their unrelated content and send them hateful words. Despite the dislikes, I feel this video proves that Vov is able to draw eager crowds by doing what he does well, and it's a sign that he's not a complete nobody. He might be able to hold his own, dare I say, without the world record. On the subject of Vov Dylan's diverse array of talents, this interview by All Things Entertainment reveals reveals that Vov is also a salsa dancer and choreographer, even having met his wife through salsa dancing and opening a salsa studio with her. This promo photo for their studio is on the... Very spicy. I reverse image searched this photo in hopes of finding more information about their salsa school, but all I got was this. Yes, wow. my wife likes to say she's married to the fastest fingers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's enough about that, so we should turn our focus back onto Vov's primary talent that has been called into question following his world record attempts. His violin skills. Blowing farts into the wind in front of live audiences is not all that he's known for, so what else does he perform? One of the purposes for his infamous Studio 10 interview was to promote his tour at the time, called Beyond the Danube. While I was browsing his websites in the media's coverage of the tour, there was a particular epithet of his that was frequently repeated. Australia's answer to Andre Re Australia, Andre Re Australia's answer to Andre Re Australia's Andrew Rue? I have come across some websites, including Vov's official bio on his management company's page, that soften their tone and say he is merely inspired by Andre Ryu's performances. But there's far more coverage advertising him as an equal or even a replacement for the legendary Andre Ryu, who has been bringing a fantasy world of classical music elegance through billboard charting tours to mainstream audiences for five decades. If Vov is going to compare himself to Andre Ryu so much, why don't we also do that? Let's look at their respective performances of the famous Blue Danube Waltz.
my god. I'm not one to shame anybody for their production value. I'm the person who insisted on yelling in front of her laptop for the better part of a year instead of going out and actually buying a microphone. But there were other issues with Vov's performance that are unrelated to his setup, most notably rushing and poor ensemble communication, which I've also noticed in other performances of his I've watched. If this is the extent of what you have to offer to your audiences, Maybe don't go around one-upping and comparing yourself to one of the greatest performers of all time, but calling himself Australia's Andre Ru, I feel that Bob is saying that Andre Ru's performances are somehow exclusionary to Australians, like they're too swamp-ass country to comprehend the rich people stuff. Therefore, for his fellow Australian Hicks, he's the appropriate substitute for THE Andre Ru. Vov occasionally goes one step further to say that he, in a way, is able to top Andre Ru and go beyond the Danube, as some may say, because he has patented the revolutionary performance tactic of playing Queen right after Johann Strauss Jr. Modernizing. Absolutely. Modernizing the violin. This review on his promotional poster says that his ability, personality, and stage presence is a match for Andre Ru. And he's much prettier too. Holy Jesus. Can I mention that every single source, whether from Vov himself or from outside media, always says that he has been called, or is known as, the Andre Ru of Australia? Who is calling him that? It reminds me of that one person everybody's probably met who's trying to give themselves a nickname that nobody else is calling them. Yo, what's poppin'? My name's Jack, but my friends call me J Money. What's good? Bro, nobody calls you that. Man, shut up, they aren't supposed to hear that. Anyways, J Money out, catch you on the flip flop. <laughs> I also want to talk about another tour he did that was being promoted in the same All Things Entertainment article I got the sensual salsa dancing photo from. It was an album and a tour called The Band Played On, which are period appropriate arrangements of music the band aboard the Titanic played. Upon hearing that they were going to use the original songbooks in Survivor Stories, I thought they were going to create a touching tribute to the musicians who went down with their ship. Right? Well, the article says to not expect a tear-jerking experience, because the purpose of this tour is to provide a bright, happy, old-fashioned cruise experience, peppered with anecdotes. About the last moments aboard the Titanic. Vov doesn't tell us what kinds of anecdotes he tells during his show, but an example he gave was how the families of deceased musicians were still billed for the costs of their uniforms. Is he maintaining the jovial atmosphere at his show with similar stories of grieving families being screwed over? I don't know. Now why did Bob Dylan create an entire album and show dedicated to 1910s cruise ship music named after, may I remind you, the Titanic? He says, I get compared to two things, Andre Ryu, please stop that, or the Titanic. So this album is dedicated to all those that think of the Titanic when they see me. I'm sorry Bob, but I don't know how much of a compliment that is. On one hand, I can say with enough confidence that most people, when asked to randomly think of a violinist, don't think of the musicians aboard the Titanic, but I also see this in my head. Hello, Mr. Dylan! You put on such an amazing performance tonight. It reminded me so much of the Titanic. It was just like the tragedy that killed 1,500 people that still used to describe catastrophic disasters over 100 years later, because I also felt like I was dying throughout. I'll be sure to catch you on your tour next year. Titanic 2, Electric Boogaloo. Again, thank you so, so much. I'm not being biased in choosing tours I didn't like from him. I did look at all of his tours, but most of them were collections of old movie songs or popular pieces that didn't have the media coverage and backstory the two tours I just discussed had. So what have I learned after looking into two of Vov Dylan's tours? The way Vov promotes Beyond the Danube by putting down an established titan in the industry is another example of the differences between what he does and how he talks about them. I'm starting to feel that despite his talent, which he obviously has as a professional violinist, how he talks about himself really makes him seem like an asshole. The idea behind the band plays on was not as terrible as metaphorically challenging Andre Ru to come at you bro, but the asshole status he has in my mind from the marketing choices he made for his world record and other tours is certainly not helped with the decisions he made in poor taste. Going back to Vov's infamous Studio 10 interview after discussing some of his tours, you may remember that the very first line out of the interviewer's mouth is that geniuses are born, not created. Which makes for a really good segue into another way Vov likes to promote himself. A phrase he uses so often, it rivals calling himself Andre Ru, is that he was first recognized at 21 months old. 
By the way, here's the newspaper clipping to prove it. And that was his Harry Potter scar, the indicator of his greatness. You were pretty much a baby when you picked up the violin. Yes, uh, as, as my mum likes to say, it was a very difficult birth. I came out fully formed with violin and bow in hand. Okay, I'll admit, that's actually kind of really funny. <laughs> but I was, wow. I, was, I was first recognized at age 21 months with my first newspaper article playing the violin and it's stayed that way ever since. We've seen this from the get-go, from the world record saga from earlier in this video, in that Bob in his interviews really like to say that what he has is innate and inaccessible to us regular peons, that he was simply born with an untapped surplus of musical talent into the right place at the right time which is into his musically inclined family that he also discusses frequently. According to his about page, Bob is a third generation musician and a second generation violinist because musical ability is genetically inherited now. It's just like how my mom was born into a family of doctors, which is why she was performing open heart surgery at the age of two. Whether he was able to prenatally absorb their superpowers or not, there's no denying that Bob has a close relationship with his musical relatives, especially with his father, violinist Evan Ellsley, who taught him how to play the violin. Bob's father is in fact so close with him, he was the best man at his wedding. Seeing that he values the familial tradition of inborn musical talent so much, is Vov up to the challenge of nurturing the fourth generation of elite musicians of the Ellsley dynasty? The answer appears to be yes. In this interview in 2015, Vov says that his daughter Avalon is playing the piano and violin every day. At the time of the interview, Avalon is four months old. That's right, months. How? Vov has got to have a very liberal interpretation of what it means to play an instrument, because I'm pretty sure at that time, his daughter was sleeping 15 hours a day and had yet to eat solid food. Vov was so eager to start excavating his daughter's superpowers as early as possible, he had a newborn-sized violin made for her birth by the luthier Scott Chow, who had worked with the likes of Nigel Kennedy and Itzhak Perlman. If the name Scott Chow sounds familiar, it's because he's the same guy who supposedly made Bob's violin he played in his Studio 10 interview, the one that is outfitted with NASA electrodes to alter its acoustics. Well, in a way, the, uh, the, the violin's made by a chap called Scott Chow, uh, who lives in America, and what, you know, the old saying of old violins sounding better than the new violins? Yes. What they've done is they've put these electrodes with a chap from NASA and made the violin would settle down so it sounds a lot older than what it actually is. Wow. I wanted to look into this weird NASA violin stuff further because that detail was just so bizarre. For a video I made over a year ago, I briefly searched Bob's website, NASA's website, and Google to no avail. And now even knowing who Scott Chow is, my searches yield no connections to NASA because of course they won't. Why would the American Space Exploration Program be decking out an Australian violinist's instrument? Not to mention, if there really is technology where you can slap some electrodes onto anything and change its acoustics, that would literally break the planet with how many uses it would have. I gave up on that detail because even with how out of left field it was and how many questions I have about it, such as did Vov misunderstand something during the construction of his violin? Did he make it up himself because it seems way too detailed just to be a casual lie? Did a publicist make this up? Why was this story made up? I feel like answering these questions didn't matter at all after the stuff I already learned about him. At the root of it all, weird things like this and everything we've seen before stem from the desire to make him larger than life, the fully equipped invincible superhero that the violin world and all of music desperately needs. But at what cost? Here are some observations I've gathered from studying the complex enigma that's Bob Dylan. He has many musical influences for his shows, but consistently chooses to promote himself as their adversary or their superior. He has said in one interview that his success came about with a little bit of talent, a lot of hard work, and a splash of good luck. As is the case for all musicians, dare I say all humans, and it's good that he's honest with it, but he credits being a natural born genius far more than he credits the hard work he put in between then and now. He tells his potential violin students to not consider taking up an instrument before the age of five so that they're developed enough to learn this skill, but he takes pride in himself and his daughter for falling out of the womb playing musical instruments. I don't care how the man raises his child, his daughter Avalon appears to look up to her father and enjoy what she's doing, but their documented extra early music start in the press implies that families like theirs are just built different and are therefore subject to different standards for their superior intellect. Most importantly, concerning Bob's fastest violinist world record, he's clearly possessive of it and takes great pride in having achieved it, but he immediately flakes the instant anybody calls its legitimacy into question. 
He wants to seem bigger than he really is, and the reasoning's clear. It's all for media attention, which will always be crucial to his survival. In order to promote his career via mainstream outlets, he has to buy into pre-existing tropes that are confirmed to work in mainstream media. He's a bored superhero who has what most people can't. Nobody wants to hear that hard work is the answer to success. He's destined to upbraid the current landscape of music. Andre Ryu can eat Bob's butthole because Bob has the bravery and innovation to play Michael Jackson and he doesn't. He can prove that violinists are not nerds and playing extra fast means he's extra good! Amazing! Look, I play a few instruments, and music is important to me, but I don't study music nor am I seeking a career as a musician. I'll never understand how difficult it is to be a musician looking for exposure, the one chance that could set you for life. Bob used to take gigs at topless mud wrestling bars serenading bikers half-naked girlfriends, so he absolutely knows what it means to struggle and hustle. I feel like Bob's being somebody he's not, just so he could keep the media attention that got him to where he is now, but acting how he does presently is only shooting him in the foot. I'm by no means a reputable source for advice, especially for a seasoned musician like Bob, but in my humble opinion, Bob needs to remember why his loyal fans love him. According to reviews, people love him because his performances are down to earth intimate and not intimidating or pretentious. Vav has promised he doesn't want to educate his audiences with his music, which I interpret as him not wanting to present obscure, intense pieces for the sake of high art and appreciating classical music. But he instead chooses to play the hits that diverse audiences are bound to enjoy, and I commend him for his versatility, even though I still maintain he shouldn't dump on Andre Rue for not doing what he does. Vav's accessibility reminds me of Lindsay Sterling. People have said for years that they don't consider her a technically competent violinist, but she's making far more money and seeing far more success than any of her critics are because she knows what modern audiences want. And I see that potential in Vob as well. I love anybody who seeks to make a genre of music typically seen as elitist more mainstream. I also have to admit that Vob has an amazing charisma and stage presence, as well as a good sense of humor. And I can see myself having fun at one of his shows, maybe without the bumblebee shredding. If I have the chance to say one thing to Vov, it would be, Sir, I don't know how difficult it is to be a musician, but the way you currently try to expand your audience and maintain relevance is hurting you more than it helps. You don't need to be what the media wants you to be, because people already love you for the way you are. I am not such a clever one about the latest fads. I admit I was never one adored by local lads. Not that I ever try to be a saint. I'm the type that they classify as quaint. I'm old-fashioned. I love the moonlight. I love the old-fashioned things. The sound of rain. Upon a window pane, the starry song that April sings. This year's fancies are passing fancies, but sighing sighs, holding hands, these my heart understands. I'm old fashioned, but I don't mind it. That's how I want to be. As long as you agree to stay old fashioned with me.